For our next and our final talk of today's portion of the conference on language and multilingualism, I'd like to introduce our speakers, Ravi Venkataramani, the CEO of CreaDocs, and Dr. Vivian Bachelet, founder and editor-in-chief of MedWave. They'll be joining us online, followed by a presentation by Edgar Garcia, who traveled, I think, the furthest to be with us today, coming all the way from Veracruz, Mexico, who's going to join us in person. Please welcome our next guests. And Ravi and Vivian, you're welcome to uh, unmute and turn on your cameras and share your screen. I'm very happy to be here, and thank you so much for the invitation. I will first be talking about five minutes about my journal and how we got all of this started. And then I'll hand it over to Ravi so that he can talk about the technology that is underpinning what we're doing now. So this is our presentation. Uh, we are a partnership and friendship. <laughs> We've become friends with time working together, Ravi and I and his team and, and my team. Um, especially during the pandemic. Uh, so this is me. I am founder and editor-in-chief of MedWave. MedWave is a medical uh, journal that I will be explaining a bit about. And Ravi is chief uh, executive officer of, um, there you go, CreaDocs. Right. Yes, next. So um, to begin this very short presentation, it's 1715 now. I just want to, I don't want to go uh, beyond five minutes. English is the dominant language in scientific literature. And however, there are many, many reasons for introducing bilingualism in academic journals. Um, it's been avoided generally because there is a perception that there are high costs associated to publishing in English or in dual languages. And also because some people are uh, have said the caveat that there can be inconsistencies between the versions. And so preferably it would be best not to have multiple languages. That's something that has been uh, said uh, between the source language and the translated version. Not yet, Ravi, please. We carried out a two year long quality improvement intervention together uh, to overhaul the peer review, copy editing, translating and publication technologies to ensure full bilingualism from submission to online publication. And the outcomes that we have achieved to now are full bilingualism for articles submitted in Spanish in our journal and simultaneous publication of both lang language versions while not compromising the financial sustainability of the journal. And I think this is wonderful news. Next, please. Thank you. So uh, just a little bit about what the journal is. Um, I founded this journal in the year 2000 and 2001, we came out with the first volume. For 10 years, it published conference coverage, but we uh, managed it as if it were a journal, but it was conference coverage. And in 2010, we decided to become a peer reviewed journal. In 2014, we were included in Medline and we were only publishing original articles. Uh, in 2015, many articles were also being published in English, but with significant delays between uh, the Spanish and the English version. We had a lot of issues with the author provided translations that were not good quality. And then in 20, we were always open access. In 2016, we started charging submission and publication fees, and a great majority of the articles were appearing bilingual, but continuing with these lags, lags between versions. In 2020, we stopped receiving author provided translations because the quality was very poor. Uh, we had a drop in articles published bilingual. Then came the pandemic with all of that. And then we won this grant proposal here in Chile to start in this technology, to start working on this technology to do bilingualism. And that's when we teamed up with Ravi. So we started in 2021 to test uh, this whole platform in a staging environment, we adapted all of the policies. And then in, by 2022, and this comes up to date, 100% of articles are being published simultaneously in English and Spanish, or in English only if the submission, the original submission was in English. We do have sustainability ensured because thanks to a steady stream of submissions, of course, and also because we have used a lot of um, technology and artificial intelligence to do the translations uh, that 
has made things cheaper. So we do not charge the translation to uh, our authors. Next, please. So what were our problems? Uh, we had a we did we had a vocation to have a bilingual publication, but this was difficult to manage. There were high costs and a lot of inefficiencies. We were using before transitioning into this uh, technology that Ravi is going to show you. We were using OJS for peer review, which was highly inefficient. And we also were publishing in a legacy content manager that was inefficient and that and there was a lot of production variability associated to that content manager. We were not able to import and generate XML JATS files. The graphic interface was older than five years. There were limitations in the deployment and functionalities in, in the HTML of the articles, high costs and issues in publishing in English. Next, please. So after doing this quality improvement intervention, uh, we did publish an article on this, by the way, in Learn Publishing. So the full story is all there. Our first achievement was in publication, the automation of article publishing, including import and export of complete articles in X XML JATS format. Also the automated generation of bibliographic files and metadata publication on a single website of both Spanish and English maintaining the journal's current advantage of publishing bilingually under a single DOI. And this is really, really important. Next, please. Uh, so now we have a full bilingual submission system provided by CreaDocs that we work together with. Uh, we have rehauled uh, the copy editing side of CreaDocs to ensure bilingualism. And that's what Ravi is going to be talking about. We use DeepL and Grammarly Grammarly under the careful eye of a medically trained editor to do the translations and full consistency both and both versions are author approved using the CreaDocs online production system. Next, please. Uh, so yeah, scope. So we're fine. We'll skip this one and we'll go straight to show you what the graphics are that we what we used to have and what we have now. Next, please. So ooh, I think it's not very clear here, but on the left, no, not that one. On the left, these were the old graphics with which we started in, in the year 2001, all online only. And on the right, you can see the homepage and an article level page of the new graphics, both in English and Spanish. Next, please. And here comes the full um, uh, platform from submit from acceptance, actually. This is the part where after the acceptance, so it's not the whole peer review to uh, being able to come out with the JATS files, but Ravi will explain more on that. Next, please. So over to Ravi now, thank you. I did that in six minutes. Thank you, Vivian, that was, that was a very efficient. <laughs> So yeah, so so thanks. I think uh, it was a uh, amazing opportunity for us to work together as companies across uh, across the globe, literally uh, over in Chile and India, to collaborate on this solution. And I think when Vivian first talked to us, she explained her problem. She didn't explain the problem right away. She said, "Hey, I I love your system. I want to move from OJS to you. And uh, hey, can we work together?" So it seemed like an easy enough problem, and I was lulled into into working together. And it was later on that Vivian presented this, this, this actual vision that she had, which was to allow for both Spanish and English publications. And as they went through the system to allow for them to, to progress and add acceptance then make a decision to translate and then take it through the process. Now, CreaDocs was built uh, very much in collaboration with publishers. And we've always prided ourselves on that, that we're able to collaborate and come up with technologies that make sense to address the particular problem. What we did not uh, have in at that point was this bilingual aspect, which was we always assumed most things happen in English. I think the world thinks that we all, everything is being done in English. And Vivian was very kind to point out, hey, guess what? But 85% of the world does not have English as their native language. And so it made it an important problem for us to solve. And so this was the uh, workflow that Vivian presented, is the author would be submitting in Spanish, the evaluation would happen in Spanish, the review itself may happen in Spanish, and then the comments uh, would be added to the manuscript. So it meant that we needed to change our system, which we did. And so we built an interface, which was both in English and Spanish. If you'll notice on the top right, you can change the language of submission from English or Spanish. 
and the Spanish authors are able to submit in Spanish. All the instructions are presented that way. And as they progress through the system, the uh, reviewers can add their comments also in Spanish. So pretty much the entire part of the system has been uh, translated to fit either Spanish or any other language for that matter. And as the review goes through the process, all of the emails that come through, so we have various screens that allow for emails to be sent between reviewers and, and, and the authors. And all of these are also translated. We have automated email template setup, which allows for uh, things to be consistent as we send that across. When the authors are presented their particular uh, comments, they're able to review those comments and then submit a revised manuscript. And upon receipt of the revised manuscript, the peer reviewers can then make a decision on that particular version and decide to accept. Now, the amazing thing about this is uh, compared to some of the other customers who primarily work in English, the authors do not have to translate in English right at the beginning. Translation is postponed to uh, post acceptance. And it also means the reviewers are now available who can uh, try review in Spanish rather than have to look for English language reviewers. So it's a very big advantage that most publishers should be considering. As we go forward now, once the decision has been made, uh, we go through a series of steps. The first step is to make sure the content is structured, formatted, and styled, uh, upon which the uh, content is then edited by a Spanish copy editor. Once the uh, editing is finished, the author is able to review the manuscript, at which point it comes back to the publisher, who's then able to assign a translator. In this case, we're first assigning the translation to a, a DPL system. This is done by Vivian offline. This is a uh, work, work in progress for us, where we're trying to connect directly to DPL. But currently what happens is the translator uh, loads the article offline into DPL, gets the version back, and then puts it back in the system. So this is to show you what that works like. Once it goes through copy editing, uh, the author can not only see the uh, edited text, but also can see the PDF at the same time. So this allows them the confidence to know that everything that they wanted has made it to the article. And then at this point, Vivian is able to see the article and then send it off to the translator for review. The translator would then be checking for uh, the consistency and making sure everything is done. Uh, they'd be uploading the translated manuscript after going through DPL. And here's where they're able to compare. So you're able to see the version that was there uh, from the Spanish version to now the English version. And uh, the translator can then look at both and make sure these are okay. So what happens in this step is after the DPL translation, there is a uh, subject matter expert who will review the article in both languages. They would be uh, cognizant of the, the science as well as having knowledge of both English and Spanish. And in this case, they're reviewing it to make sure DPL has done a good job. So once all that is done, it goes back to the publisher who reviews both these publications and make sure that they're ready for publication and then uh, issue, hit a button at which point the entire JAS package is generated for the Spanish and English version and uploads it to uh, Vivian's content vendor, which is called Active. And they're able to then publish both articles at the same time on the website. So some of the benefits of this innovation, uh, as we said before, is simultaneous publication of Spanish and English version under a single DOI allowing for a bigger and more diverse reviewer pool, enhance appeal for authors as a result of bilingualism. And the reason this is important is Vivian has made it such that uh, as part of her publication process, the authors do not have to pay for translation. That's included in their processing charge. And this is now becoming a lot more attractive for authors. They're able to publish in, uh, submit in Spanish, get accepted at which point the translation happens automatically. And the quality of translation is also way, way better than it used to be uh, in the earlier process. The journal is financially sustainable and independent, and that's something that's, that's very important and very quite happy to promote that on our side. Uh, support for the work, uh, voice of the local researcher, so it doesn't have to be in English. We're able to delay that, that whole translation process. Uh, Vivian, uh, maybe you should talk about your impact factor, which uh, you received earlier this year. Okay. Well, she's very she's very humble. So yeah, she, uh, we're very proud of the fact that uh, Vivian now has received an impact factor for her journal as well, and uh, it's 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 uh, more than a fraction. It's it's in uh, one or two, I think, uh, as as of latest check, and uh, we're able to bridge the geopolitical divides through diversity, inclusivity, and what this means is we're able to bring in a lot more people into the process. We're not restricting language as a as a criteria. We're able to be inclusive and, and welcome all of these voices in, which basically means that we're having sound science with, with a good review across the world. 
and uh, we won an award. So just in September, uh, Vivian and I were invited to the Alps uh, conference, at which point we were asked to make a presentation and judged by a jury, as well as the, the general uh, uh, Alps members. And they decided to award us the Alps Award for Innovation in Publishing. And we were uh, yeah thrilled, thrilled to receive this award. Of course, it was, a, I guess, uh, a great reward for us for two years of hard work, but this was something that we believed was important to do, and we we're so so glad that it was a success. We still have a lot of uh, work we have ahead of us in terms of taking this to the next level, and we look forward to to doing that together. Naveen, any last words? No, I just think that it's um, extraordinarily important to be able to promote and propitiate local languages, uh, local research, research that is locally pertinent, and especially to not lose the quality of some research designs that need that are built on language and the use of language. And I'm thinking here especially about ethnographic studies and qualitative studies where language, the local languages are key to understanding uh, culture and anthrop anthropology and so on and so forth. So while ours is a medical journal, we do do a lot of, um, we publish some qualitative research and it's important to do that research in your local language and then be able to expand the impact of your research to the global south, to the whole world. What I mean is that maybe some research that is being done in Latin America can be generalizable to other countries of the global south that have similar realities to ours. Um, we will not understand each other between Africa and Southeast Asia or South Asia uh, with, through Spanish. It has to be through a lingua franca and the lingua franca is English. So having giving this benefit to our authors that they are able to produce their science and communicate it in their local language, have it reviewed, peer reviewed in the local language, but then also ensure the impact to other parts of the world through having a consistent translation done without spiraling costs has been very gratifying. Um, and it's actually a mission and, and something that has driven me for nearly 10, well, for 10 years, actually, because the decision we made at the editorial board was made in 2013. We're now in 2023. So it's a, it's been a 10 year long journey to, to have a sustainable journal and fully bilingual. And the pandemic gave us the opportunity to work together with Ravi on Meetly meetings through Zoom and all of us were cooped up, so it was a great opportunity to really connect. Absolutely. Uh, I think just, just to say on our side, we're so glad we're able to hit DEI goals that many, many publishers are aiming to do, but we didn't really go after DEI. We went after a real problem, which is we want to get these authors who have great work that they want to get published, make that process easier for them, make it possible for reviewers also to participate in this process and in the end get a fantastic publication. Uh, and the fact that we're able to do that and include a whole uh, world uh, of, of researchers and authors who otherwise may be shut out was amazing. And so we're, we're so glad of what we've been able to achieve here. I think in other languages, there's a lot of uh, opportunity, not just in the global south, but also in Western European languages and others who otherwise may be forced down this English path where they have to go spend monies to go translate in English right at the beginning. And, and not know if they're going to be accepted or not. This takes away the anxiety, brings a lot more people into publishing, I think uh, is a win-win for everybody. So I highly recommend everybody look at this particular model, look at how this could be adapted for your own scenario. Thank you. Thank you both so much and congratulations on your very well-deserved award uh, at the recent meeting. So we did have two questions that came in from the online participants. Um, one is, could you specify the name of the software uh, that does the translation? And the second uh, question is, oh, yeah. go ahead, please. I'll go for the software. So we're using DeepL. This is a Germany-based company and that does great translations, multilingual. They use artificial intelligence and, and 
I would call it like language based models, you know, that kind of thing that is very in vogue now, but they, we've been using this now for a couple of years. And um, so the technical editor, he, he, in this case, because these are two um, early career um, medical doctors who are based in Argentina, they are my, um, my English language editors and technical editors. So they will export the Spanish accepted, copy edited, and you know, author approved version. They will take it, pass it through DeepL. They will get a pre preliminary translation into Spanish. Then they will go through it with Grammarly, with the help of Grammarly. Grammarly is really wonderful. I mean, both of these softwares are really amazing. And they will make the calls, you know, what to accept, what not, what to correct, what to put it in, how style, how style is really important. Once that's been done, then they will upload this new version once again to the platform, to the technology itself, where it will go through the whole process that Ravi already described. Having said that, we do want to get to the point where we can do all of that online. So it is, as Ravi said, a work in progress. Thank you for that. Uh, the second question is, obviously, Spanish is a global majority language, but what other languages are you possibly expanding this uh, workflow and process into? So the, the great news is Creadox is a, uh, uses a Unicode character set, which means we could potentially accommodate any language. We already have active conversations with uh, language, with journals which are working in German, in, in Italian, and Scandinavian at this point, we're welcoming more conversations with other publishers. I think uh, this is a great opportunity for us to collaborate and build solutions that your readers and your authors would appreciate. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, the world is open for many languages to be accommodated. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you for John and, and Pooja and for allowing me to participate this afternoon and uh, Especially thank to all of you for staying uh, until the last talk of this day. Uh, this is a, a, a brief outline of my talk. Uh, I'm going to talk about study group on academic uh, publishing in Ibero-America, uh, about multilingualism in Ibero-America, and with a scope on representative countries, uh, the case of Mexico. Uh, which is one of the largest publishing production in the region and it has a large number of indigenous language spoken. So there are many languages, but a few records of book publishers in regional languages. And lastly, uh, there are the several problems that need to be solved or perhaps just one. Uh, academic publishing in Latin America has caught the attention of experts, but it lacks comprehensive investigations. Uh, this is primarily because obtaining precise data of the academic publishing sector is challenging. The creation of the project of the cartography of the uh, Ibero-American publishing study has allowed us to work with various institutions and publishing experts from different countries on this study. Uh, this project assesses the production and, ident and identification of academic publishers. Our groups include uh, Elena Jimenez uh, from Spain, Esteban Giraldo and Juan Felipe Cordoba Restrepo from Colombia, and me from uh, Mexico. The regional center from the, for the promotion of books in Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, CERLAUC, uh, is crucial to this initiative. It's a UNESCO funded agency located in Bogota that has provided all the data on publishing in Latin America nations. Uh, UNESCO uh, states that are nearly uh, seven, thousand spoken language worldwide. Uh, in Ibero-America, uh, 4,000 training languages are spoken, and the catalog uh, of indigenous language in Mexico showed that uh, 68 languages are spoken today. This you are seeing now, uh, you can take a, a picture of the QR code. This is the project base of the uh, cartography of the 
uh, academic publishing that I belong. Um, however, let's analyze the editorial production in some countries. Uh, I'm gonna show you a, a pie chart that presents the entire Ibero-American productions of books except Brazil. Brazil is a huge uh, production. Uh, to 86% are in Spanish, 9% Portuguese, 3% in English, and that 2% are old, the production in language besides indigenous or regional ones, such as French, German, or any other language. However, let's analyze the editorial production in some countries with significant indigenous population. This appears in Guatemala, Paraguay, Bolivia, Mexico, Peru, Colombia. And you can see that uh, there's a production in that language, and that regional language. Uh, the, row, the, the second row, you can find titles in other languages as English or German, French. And uh, you can see that if there are more production in regional language, in indigenous language, there are less production in another uh, language as English, German, or French. Uh, the, there are uh, like, um, uh, if we cross that, uh, you can see that Guatemala has, has the most uh, uh, number, or large number of uh, publications in, in indigenous language. Uh, as the less uh, one of the less uh, publications in another in an, another language, uh, what happened in in Mexico? Uh, the percentage, uh, if we uh, talk about translations, uh, each year to Mexican academic book uh, are the eighty percent of the production of uh, books in Mexico. Uh, each year. Well, Thompson and 500 books are translated, uh, and that uh, two thirds of them being translated from English, and then French, in the same uh, level, the Nahuatl is a uh, indigenous language in Mexico, and they come uh, a few uh, translation from German, uh, Portuguese, or. Uh, another language, Chinese, Japanese. Uh, if we cross that uh, translated books in Latin America with the indigenous uh, language uh, books published, we can find that uh, that line, that the green one are the translations uh, books. Uh, and we can find that Guatemala had the, the, the middle of them uh, the, the blue lines are the regional language. The pale blue is like a, a aquamarina. Is the uh, are the language of um, uh, another language like uh, English or French or, or Portuguese. Uh, so uh, the graph shows a big difference between translations and publications in indigenous language in academic tests. A preliminary analysis in Colombia and Mexico uh, found inaccuracies in book classification during ISBN registrations. Uh, Mexican publishing production is registered by the state through the ISBN agency at the National Copyright Institute, which operates under the Ministry of Public Education and oversees copyright protections and promotion as well as the management of the ISBN and the ISSN numbers. Publisher provides the necessary information when to apply for registration using the platform offered by CERLAC in 17 Latin American countries. If all necessary information is provided, the ISBN number will be granted within five days. In Mexico, the international standard book number is a compulsory registration for all publishing agents as per the federal copyright law. 
Thus, almost all the national editorial production is registered with this database, making the primary source for reliable statistics on publishing production. The misclassification may have various causes, including outdated catalogs and insufficient training for metadata incorporation in publishers' ISBNs. However, we have now discovered that the problem is not an editor's registry error, but rather a database error, which yields a non-representative list of language for 17 countries. This result in a closed list of five entries is, uh, I'm gonna show you uh, a screenshot of the, the platform. Uh, and it's appeared in the platform, um, Nahuatl, yes, Aymara or Guarani, uh, alongside Czech, uh, German, Portuguese, or even Latin, Latin. Uh, specialists may face all challenges when transcribing certain language, such as the disagreement of whether a consonant or liquid or glottal or the number of vowels that compose language, which heightens spelling standardization. However, catalogs of language and variants do exist, particularly in the case of Mexico. It is necessary to verify the existence of catalogs in other countries, but taking into account the tradition of linguistic studies on indigenous groups on the continent, they should exist. Considering the demand for multilingualism in open science, Spanish academic production stands out as a noteworthy language. There is no doubt that there has been a significant push to legitimize scientific output in Spanish for nearly a decade. Various studies largely conducive in Spain have highlighted the economic value of the language worldwide. Additionally, Spanish has gained tra traction as a knowledge circulation language and is the second most commonly spoken language based on population size. However, this assertion regarding the Spanish language does not not seem to be equitative for other languages present on the continent. The editorial output in another language often fails to be proportional with the population that speak in the region. That is why it is important to make visible the production and the knowledge that is published, and not to leave it only under the label of other or at most uh, indigenous languages. We need to name in order to know our Bible diversity. Thank you. Edgar, one question I have: yes. uh, when you're looking at when you're looking at the translations, um, are you looking at both translations from Spanish into indigenous languages, or is it from indigenous languages into Spanish? Is it both, or what? Which uh, are from just in could be Spanish and indigenous language, or just indigenous language. Maybe you could talk a little bit more what you think of, for example, in the question of indigenous language or other or other translation. How how much do you see this increasing in the future in terms of uh, translation based uh, AI based translation? Okay, but for for me, is is the solution. Uh, I think a AI could be uh, uh, and Bibi and Rabbi show how they work, uh, and now I think I, this is going to be increasing uh, in a few years, and it's possible to somewhere uh, from uh, from Mexico from uh, to speak all indigenous language could open and paper from another. Uh, language and read in their own language. That that will be. I think that that is the path to to that we are moving on, and that will be the solution. And the Bibi and Rabi, as they show, uh, they could uh, they have uh, the, the human factor that are very important to 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 publisher that are. Uh, behind the, the the text and that. 
test the human factor that we don't uh, have to uh, uh, to miss? Uh, I think it's um, this is this is inevitable. I mean, everything that's happening in the world, the troubles and all of that are, are largely due also to an to an to an overzealous globalization process that started around the 80s and 90s and and has now been and, and it's been very in some aspects negatively consequential so um my viewpoint as an editor is that we have to bring together local realities but also um understand that we are living in a globalized world. And the concept behind that is called localism, which I find very interesting. So we do have to produce um, our knowledge from our own realities and our science. Uh, but I think publishers should be very keen on expanding their um, linguistic reach and they should start considering that multilingualism or bilingualism is here to stay. So they will have to adapt their technologies. Otherwise, we will have um, an increasing amount of silos and ghettos, and the rift between the North and the South will become even deeper. So if we want to come together as a humanity, we really need all of us on the same boat. And so we have to acknowledge the small local realities together with the big global ones. And sometimes it doesn't appear like that. The hegemony of English, for example, has been excessive. It has been to the expense of local knowledge and local realities and local cultures. So that has to be rebalanced. We're trying to find a way in that. If I just had to add to what Vivian said, I think uh, earlier we had we didn't have the choice, we didn't have the tools or technologies. Now with AI and the tools that we have, it's become a lot easier. And I think taking down this path of hey, how can we be more inclusive, how can we build these tools that allows everybody to communicate in their own language but still talk to each other, is a wonderful way of bringing people together and making sure that information flows freely. I think that's that's what we should look at globalization being uh, bringing as being to the table is that ideas are being shared across the world. We have uh, the benefit of various inputs and make the right decisions as, as a single world rather than be sitting in our own pockets. But don't force people down your own path. Allow them to express in the path uh, where they're most comfortable, but then uh, use technology to make uh, people understandable across different uh, languages. I think that's what we've tried to do here. Uh, I'm hoping that more people are inspired by this and take this forward. One uh, one thing that I think we'll be seeing, uh, and I wonder if you're seeing this already, is AI-based translation combined with AI-based audio. So um, Edgar mentioned like some of the indigenous people might not be reading in their language, but they could certainly hear it. And and people around the world being able to to have an audio version of, of basically anything uh, with AI assisted. Have, have you seen any of that already? I, I think, I mean, you see the beginnings of it. I, I've got requests in from publishers about doing podcasts. So I see the podcast now starting to uh, accompany the article. So the podcast production uh, tools are better. I think there's certain things that we think AI is a solution to everything. I think people are still, uh, Paramount, the authors can provide a, a good audio. We're able to use technology to package it along with the article. As far as AI uh, presenting the uh, the content as well as the author can, I, I, I doubt that AI can be used for more quality checking or packaging or doing uh, things like that. But uh, I think the author is still a paramount in terms of being able to express their opinions, express their concept in their own voice. And I think that, that where, that's where the, the real power comes out. And now, now I think that uh, multilingualism is is a goal. It's a goal that we are uh, put in front of us, and we have to talk about it because we found it that really we in, in Latin America we don't have really a multiculturalism, mm -hmm. multilingualism. So uh, they have a lot of language, additional uh, language that we are practically ignore. 
uh, and the scholar publishing and in, in and all the book industry. So, uh, but we have to to go to arrive to multilingualism. So this is uh, the, the path that we have to lead on. Any other questions? No questions online? No, just that uh, you can retreat this into the mic. Uh, an attendee said, I wish we had the applause emoji for this entire final presentation. Yeah. Technology, the tools, the intent, and the possibilities. Echoing. Ravi, I know it must be pretty late for you in Chennai. We started in the morning with a presenter from New Zealand. We're ending the day with a presenter in India. So this has really been a, a global conference. Thank you very much. And thank you, Vivian, for joining us from Chile. And Edgar, instead of joining from Mexico, came all the way up here. So thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation.